Uh, my name is Alex. Uh, I think a lot of people here know me already. Um, you may or may not have an understanding of what it is that I actually do uh, for my, my job though. Um, so I say I'm a senior research associate. I, I work at uh, the University of Toronto's Center for Analytics and AI Engineering. Uh, I'm extremely lucky that the work that I do is like incredibly broad in its remit. So I kind of just say that I like do AI. Um, and that obviously like in the last couple of years, especially with uh, ChatGPT and things like that has become uh, a really in-demand position. But uh, I've been doing this uh, basically all of my uh, short career. Uh, so I did my undergraduate degree in artificial intelligence. I did my master's degree in artificial intelligence. Um, so I've, I've learned a little bit about this stuff uh, in, the, in the time that I've been, I don't know, doing things. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, with, with all of that, like, because I, I, get, I work at the university, but I have this like weird position where I just help people out with AI research, um, I don't have to really be very in favor of AI, even though it's like the, the crux of what my job is. Uh, and so because of that, like that's why I consider myself to be a, a bit of an AI skeptic uh, researcher. So when I say that, like there's, there's a lot of stuff that I think is uh, really useful about AI, but I'm not uh, afraid to talk about why I think it's really bad. Uh, and so tonight you'll get a little bit of that where I'm just gonna talk about some of the developments that have been happening in the last year or so uh, around like large language models and generative AI uh, more broadly. Uh, I kind of threw this together. So it's a little bit of like just touching on a bunch of different topics. Uh, I want to have a good amount of time for Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions about generative AI, uh, LLMs, especially like uh, the implications, like we, let's talk about it uh, afterwards. So uh, with that in mind, uh, what's, what's going on with generative AI? Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about is uh, uh, detecting AI-generated content. So this is something that people have been uh, like really concerned about in the last couple of years. Uh, researchers have been talking about it for a lot longer, but it's suddenly become really important. Uh, when ChatGPT first sort of really became uh, a big thing people were talking about, uh, the earliest technology that was really being used uh, made headlines with tools like this Zero GPT or GPT-0, I think it was, that you might have heard of. Uh, and it was promising that you know you could paste in text and it would tell you if it was written by ChatGPT or not. Um, the, the method by which that works is actually kind of simple. Uh, and there's a nice analogy to how we read text in the human brain. So despite what you may think, when you are reading uh, like a book or a block of text, you're not paying attention to every word the same amount. Uh, your brain is essentially doing some modeling uh, in, internally about what words are like obvious that are going to happen next and you just don't even read them. So for example, if we have the sentence, uh, if you were to journey to the north of England, the idea here is that when you once you've read if you, the word were coming next is like really, really likely. And so your brain is actually not even going to read that word because it's like there's the idea that something else is going to come next is so uh, inconsequential that you just assume that that's the next word. And this is is actually what's happening in your brain. Uh, but other words, you know, you don't necessarily know that they're going to come next. And so you have to pay a bit more attention uh, when you're reading to understand them. Uh, if we want to figure out if text is written by ChatGPT, we can essentially ask that model how likely it thinks each word in the sample is, and then get like an average sense of how surprised the model is by that text sample. And so that's the whole uh, basis behind that kind of approach is just how surprised was the model that those sequence of words that is in the text sample was being chosen. If the model thinks it's really likely, then there's a chance it was written by ChatGPT. But if it's like totally surprised by every word, uh, then it's almost certainly not written. Uh, the issue with that is, is twofold. One, you have to have the model that uh, you're working with like to hand. So if someone is developing their own model, you can't do this because you don't have access to it. And the other thing is that like, sometimes people just write in a way that is kind of uh, obvious and formulaic. So if they're doing that, it's likely that these things are gonna say that's written by ChatGPT. Uh, and we saw when these, when these tools came out that a lot of people started getting accused of using ChatGPT when they actually weren't. So these tools are good at saying that something was not written by ChatGPT in the sense that the model finds it very surprising. So it's definitely not written by that model, but they're not good the other way around. Like if it says it was written by ChatGPT, that doesn't necessarily mean that it actually was. 
So this is kind of very after the fact. This is like if you have text and you're trying to work out if it was written by ChatGPT, you're like trying to catch somebody, uh, you can do this. But uh, over the last few years, there's been more work in trying to uh, make these generative models uh, include information that, that content was generated by AI uh, in the actual results. So the most basic version of this is like a literal watermark on an image. Uh, this is an example from Dolly 2, which is an image generation technique by OpenAI. Uh, when, when they release this, uh, in the bottom right corner, it just shows like a little logo. That's just in the image. So you can see it was, it was made by Dolly. Uh, this is not a great solution, obviously, because you could just crop that out. Uh, or you could add it to another image if you wanted to make it seem like it was generated by Dolly. Uh, so a lot of research has gone into how can we do this in a way that is actually not obvious uh, or even difficult to remove, uh, which sounds difficult when we're talking about an image. So over the last couple of years, we've seen these techniques uh, that are designed to add information to the actual pixels of an image in a way that is not detectable to us. And these are real examples from an approach by Google DeepMind. So this image is split in two, and one half of it actually contains the watermark, but you cannot tell that it's there. And the way that they do this is that across the entire image, they're slightly, slightly modifying the values of the pixels so that uh, there is a pattern that is visible to a computer, but the, the modifications are so tiny that a person can't see it. And the latest versions of these techniques are actually designed so that even if you're doing stuff to the image, like making it blurry or, or changing the size, hopefully uh, it's able to, to keep that watermark in there. Uh, it's still a very new technology. And you know there's always going to be ways that you can kind of remove that by distorting the image. But the hope is that you know if you're distorting the image so much to remove the watermark, then it's already kind of obvious that you're doing something to it. So that's kind of suspicious. Uh, text seems like something that is harder to, to watermark in a way that is subtle. Uh, it doesn't seem necessarily that obvious how you can uh, like generate text which has a watermark in it that you can't notice. But there are techniques that are coming out uh, that allow us to do something like this. So there's a really excellent interactive piece in the New York Times. Uh, I've linked it here, uh, and I'll try to get that on the Slack later that, that goes through this method in detail. But basically, uh, if you're at all familiar familiar with how large language models generate text, what they're doing is that every time you're adding a word to the sentence, it's predicting the likelihood for every single word in its vocabulary, uh, how likely that word is to come next. Uh, for these watermarking techniques, what they do is they split all of the words in the vocabulary into two groups. Uh, and one of those groups is words that it wants to use more than normal. And one is words it wants to use less than normal. And so with that in mind, all you have to do is when you're considering the word to choose next in the sentence, you first calculate the likelihoods as you would normally, but then you bump up the likelihood of these words that are in the in-group and you reduce the likelihood of the words that are in the out-group. And by doing this, if you have a sample of text and you wanna see if it's written by ChatGPT, you just look for the words that it is using more often than it normally would uh, or less often than it normally would. And that gives you an indication of whether it was made by your model uh, or, or not. Uh, OpenAI recently admitted that they have developed a version of this that is available for ChatGPT, but they don't want to add it to ChatGPT. Um, the, there's like, they have their own justifications for why this is. It seems kind of likely that the reason is they want people to use ChatGPT. Uh, and if you, it's like kind of undercutting their own product. So, you know, there's some interesting questions there about like, do we want to actually start requiring that companies introduce these? Uh, should we have some kind of legislation that, uh, you know, guide? there's maybe even just guidelines around when these watermarks should exist? Uh, so, yeah, like, like, it obviously is quite possible, but these companies don't have a lot of incentive to add these watermarks uh, at this stage. But uh, even with that in mind, researchers have found that ChatGPT uh, in particular does have its own sort of unique style of writing. And it actually uses certain words much more often than people do. So this is kind of like an unintentional watermark where there's a few words that if you look out for them, uh, they, if, if you see them in a text sample, that makes it much more likely that that text was written by ChatGPT uh, than you would otherwise necessarily know. Uh, so these are some examples. Uh, 
this is actually a little worrying. These are examples from scientific abstracts. And uh, this researcher, this, this group found that in the last few years, there's a, a noticeable increase, like a pretty dramatic increase in the use of these words that ChatGPT favors in abstracts in, in published scientific papers. Uh, so it's a little small, but delves is the one that ChatGPT really loves. Nobody writes delves. It's not like a word that people use, but ChatGPT really, really likes it. And so you can see that it's gone from basically zero frequency in scientific abstracts to like 0 0.003. So like uh, 0.3 of a percent. It's still kind of low, but like that's a dramatic increase. And it's quite noticeable that if it's there, it's probably because ChatGPT cho chose to use it. So uh, if you know that, you can kind of keep an eye out. And if you see words like delves or crucial, uh, you can wonder if ChatGPT was used. Uh, moving on from, from that, uh, let's talk a little bit about what's been going on with uh, lawsuits and legislation. Uh, OpenAI has been sued a ton uh, since ChatGPT was released. Uh, a lot of that has been by uh, writers and organizations like the New York Times. Uh, that was a big one that launched at the end of last year. Uh, the New York Times in particular were not just suing over the fact that OpenAI was using New York Times articles to train ChatGPT, but that uh, you could essentially get the, the model to reproduce uh, an entire article word for word if you just use the right prompt for the model. And so uh, one of the things that has been an argument for using uh, all of this stuff as training data is, well, it's transformative because it's just going in and then something else is coming out. But the argument being used by the New York Times is that, well, it's not something else coming out. You can just get our work directly. Um, there's a really interesting method that was used by some authors to show that their books were being fed into ChatGPT uh, during training, which is that they asked for a, a summary of their book, and then uh, it would give a summary, and then they would say, give me more detail. And they would keep doing that until it got to a level of detail that you could only know from having actually seen the book. Like, because it's gone past the point that any actual summary would have described. Uh, and so that, you know, there's, there is this argument that's being used that it's like transformative, um, but clearly those books have been ingested into the model uh, without permission. And so we have to see like whether that is even uh, considered to be a violation of copyright or not. Uh, so it's an open question. Uh, there's a really funny one that happened earlier this year. Uh, this is a great story. So, uh, Air Canada, yeah, Air Canada had a, had a chat bot on their website that you could ask questions about stuff. We were all familiar with the concept. And this person was trying to work out, uh, I guess there's like a thing where you can get a bereavement discount sometimes if you're like flying to, uh, you know, get to a, a deceased loved one or something like that. So the person asked the chat bot on the Air Canada website what the policy was. And the chat bot described a policy that was more generous than what Air Canada actually offered. And so then they booked the, the flights and all of that. And then they went and they were like, well, how do I get my, my rebate or whatever? And Air Canada said, that's not the policy. Uh, you don't get that. And so they sued. And Air Canada's defense was, well, the chatbot is a separate person. And we can't be held for what it says. And obviously, the courts didn't like that. They, they said, no, it's, it's not a person. It's not a separate legal entity. Uh, you made it. And it's on your website. And so the, the sort of response from the courts there was, if it's information on your website, then that is you saying it. And it's not up to the customer to like cross-reference that with everything that you also have on the site. Um, so it, it is actually an interesting thing though, because a lot of these models, uh, you know, as we're familiar with now, uh, they make stuff up. And so with companies integrating chatbots and LLMs into their products more and more, uh, this is an early indication that at least in Canada, uh, companies are going to be expected to like uh, hold up the claims that those chatbots make, which is, uh, is a good sign. Um, we're starting to see more legislation come into effect uh, that is specifically defining uh, how we expect people to work with uh, and develop artificial intelligence models. Uh, the EU has just recently passed this pretty big uh, AI act that I would say is like probably the first of its kind in the world. Uh, it goes quite far to define a lot of different risk levels for AI systems uh, up to like unacceptable risk, which would be models that are outright banned. Uh, and so an example of unacceptable risk 
uh, facial recognition is outright banned except for the police. Um, so anyone else is not allowed to build a, a facial recognition model. Uh, and they acknowledge that it's like really risky and there's lots of issues, um, but the police are still allowed to do it. Uh, and then the, the level below that, which is like really, really high risk includes things like AI in cars, but also interestingly, AI in toys. So, you know, if it's for children, that's considered to be at the highest risk level. Uh, and with those levels, there's like increasing responsibilities for the companies producing those models, but also for deploying them. So you can't necessarily just say, well, we bought that from Microsoft, it's Microsoft's problem. Uh, if you're putting it in your product, then it's your problem too. Uh, in Canada, we have uh, AI legislation that is slowly working its way through Parliament. Uh, it's called the Artificial Intelligence and Data Act. Um, I think it's like still in fairly early stages, so it's probably going to be some time. But we're still like in the world pretty far ahead of most countries when it comes to uh, setting this stuff out. Uh, I would say it's, it's actually fairly similar, but a bit weaker uh, compared to the EU's version. Uh, there's, I think, some conscious effort to try, like, across countries to make these things at least a little similar so that there's, like, uh, some global standards coming into play. And so the Canadian system just has, like, high risk and then everything else. Uh, and the high impact uh, AI is going to have more strict requirements, again, about how it can be created, how it can be deployed. Uh, and it's the sort of stuff that you would expect uh, is, is considered to be high impact. Uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about a little bit was uh, environmental impacts, because I think this is something that uh, is uh, top of mind for people outside of AI, and they sort of wish that it would be more top of mind for people inside AI. Uh, this is still actually like really poorly understood. Uh, I've seen a lot of headlines over the last year where they'll like give really specific numbers that sounds like they must have worked this out. And then if you dive into the numbers, it's like kind of vague how they got there. Uh, that's not to diminish the environmental impact, but just to say that we don't really have a good sense of exactly how much energy these things are using. Uh, we do know that they are using a lot of energy, though. Uh, so, so um, you know, this is more than just energy. Uh, this is like, you know, the resources that go into it. They're building new computers that requires, uh, you know, more mining and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of impacts there. Uh, we, there are some specific figures that I was able to dig up. So uh, thinking about scaling up AI capacity, this is something that you'll hear a lot about, uh, especially like from an economic standpoint. They'll talk about this in Canada as like something that we want to really be uh, on the forefront of. But what does that actually look like? Uh, it means building massive server farms that have huge, huge resource requirements. So Microsoft uh, wants to like add 50% again of their total data center capacity that they've built over the entire lifetime of Microsoft uh, in like the next year. Uh, so it's, it's a huge, huge expansion uh, in what they're doing. Uh, one of the effects of this is that we're seeing uh, uh, old uh, like coal energy plants that were going to be decommissioned. They're pushing off those decommissionings now because the energy resources uh, are back in demand in a way that uh, seemed like it was going to go away. So, you know, because we can't like immediately build new power plants, they're having to slow down uh, decommissioning old ones and things like that uh, to make up the demand in the meantime. Uh, Alberta is definitely trying to really be at the forefront of building these data centers, as you might imagine. But interestingly, they are like not committing to provide that energy. Uh, so they're kind of like, you're going to have to figure that out. I don't know what that would look like in practice. Um, but I guess like they're they're wary of the fact that like if they if they let these big data centers come in and, and use the grid, uh, that energy is going to come from other uh, things, right? So there's going to be more and more competition for that uh, that energy that does exist. Uh, on the other side, like on maybe the more positive side of that, uh, is the rise of uh, what they're calling small language models. So uh, you know these these massive large language models can do a lot of different things. Uh, they are, they're capable of many different tasks, but in a lot of cases, you're only trying to use them for something really specific. Uh, and when that's the case, uh, we're seeing a growth in research for these small models that are very specific in what they're able to do. Uh, they're not as broadly capable, but that means that they don't require as many resources. Uh, an intuitive example of how this can work. Uh, so, so I said earlier, uh, when you use ChatGPT, every time it generates a single word, 
it's calculating the likelihood for any word in its vocabulary. So it's got this huge vocabulary and it's doing that math for every single word. So an obvious thing you can do is just make the vocabulary smaller. Like it can talk just as well, but it can't use as many obscure words or words that have very specific uh, situations that they're being used. And that alone is, is able to reduce the energy complexity of the model. So, you know, similar kind of functionality, but just a shorter voc vocab uh, is actually an effective uh, way of doing that. Uh, this is really pertinent uh, for companies like Apple and Google when it comes to launching these technologies on smartphones. So, uh, you know, Apple is in the process of launching their Apple intelligence, stupid name. Um, <laughs> one of the things that they're trying to do is offloading as much of the computation onto your phone as they can. Uh, and there's obvious reasons for Apple to do that. Uh, it's cheaper for Apple uh, if your phone is doing it than if their data center is doing it. It does mean that your battery will die faster because like all of that is happening on the phone. Um, but their hope is that it will reduce the number of queries that they're having to send to these big data centers. Uh, and so their model is that every time you enter a query, it'll first try to do it on the phone. Uh, and then if it can't do it, it'll go to an Apple data center. And if that can't do it, it'll just send it to ChatGPT. Uh, so there's like a three-stage process there uh, with ChatGPT as like the ultimate fallback. Um, even though this is their strategy, uh, these, these small language models are only uh, functional on like the latest, latest smartphones. Like literally, I think the only the iPhone from this year and beyond is gonna support this. So even if there's an argument that this is like greener because it's not using data centers, uh, how many people are gonna trade in their iPhone early in order to get access to like this cool new tech uh, who otherwise, you know, they would have kept their phone for, you know, a few more years or something like that. So uh, yeah, it's, it's just interesting to think about. That's my uh, little overview. And uh, yeah, I wanna leave some time for questions.